is Christmas time a time to enjoy or endure? Is it? A bit of both? Come on. Everyone's enjoyed Christmas. Yes. Okay, all right. No one, no one has endured the, uh, the crazy rush, the mad panic of buying uh, presents, uh, the endless work in the kitchen. I have slaved away. The great... <laughs> But it's been worth it. We had a lovely time last night. We always have a special uh, meal on Christmas Eve. Uh, perfectly timed, hot weather and a hot cooked turkey with hot vegetables <laughs> but in a well air conditioned house. <laughs> no, it was wonderful. With the children and grandchildren all around. But there are certain things to endure uh, because the world tries to do something with the coming of the birth of Christ, uh, the world seeks to exploit anything in order to make money, uh, even the birth of Christ or especially the birth of Christ. I don't know the figures, but can you imagine uh, where the world's economy would be at this time of the year without Christmas? I don't think it'll save us though. But the wonder is the truth keeps on breaking through all the glamour and all the hype. We can do nothing against the truth, only for it. I, I don't think it helps for sincere believers to get angry at what the world does with Christmas. I think we're missing the point. Uh, what else can the world do? when it uh, cannot accept the truth or the need of a total work of God's grace for our sin and for our salvation. And what else does the world do when that's what the world puts its hope in? The glamour and uh, the tinsel, um, the need to make Christmas into some kind of... Uh, uh, Christmas spirit uh, that's unattached to the real events of Christ's coming. Uh, it suits the world to turn the Christmas story into some kind of happy affirmation of the human spirit but it has nothing to do with the Messiah that has been placed in a major at birth and a cross in his death. Only the truth of a king born to be crucified is big enough to reconcile this world to its faithful creator and only the truth is able to set us free by saving us from our foolish sin. The wonder is that uh, when you listen to the carols by candlelight you still hear the word of truth coming through the songs many of them and uh, no matter how much the world tries to repackage uh, Christmas, Christ's birth, uh, it can't remove the biblical witness but it does tend to sanitise that story to uh, make it into something uh, that seems uh, clean and normal and uh, a happy time for everyone. Uh, but in fact when we read Luke chapter 2 we're introduced to circumstances that in fact seem far from satisfactory for a young couple expecting their first born. Uh, we're so used to hearing the Christmas story and seeing the images on cards and even in Sunday school uh, nativity plays uh, we overlook the huge difficulties that faced Mary and Joseph. Uh, we, all we can think of is the clean tea towels on the shepherd's heads and children dressed up as cute little lambs and angels singing in the warm light of a cosy stable on a dark night. All those things go to sanitise the uh, account that we have here in Luke's Gospel. 
Instead of a glamorised version, we read about an untimely census. Now we had a census just a few months ago, didn't we? Uh, it was very stressful that night because I didn't want to deal with it and my wife couldn't understand how to, to do the computer version. Uh, we finally worked it out. Well, there was no computer version back there. Uh, they had to go to the town, uh, their own town, to register. A long, exhausting journey for a woman close to giving birth. On top of that, the pregnancy itself wasn't actually satisfactory in the eyes of the world. Uh, it was outside of marriage and in that day and culture that was far from acceptable. And then when the young couple arrive at Bethlehem, we know the story, there's no room in the inn, no appropriate accommodation for a young woman about to give birth. We're actually not told that uh, they were given a stable that's the assumption, uh, we're only told that the baby was placed in a manger, a feeding trough uh, for farm animals. And so we assume that if that was the place where the baby was put, it must have been a, some kind of stable or animal shelter. Apparently if you go to Bethlehem now, there's a church built around uh, a cave uh, and that cave, it is assumed, was the pl birthplace of uh, Jesus uh, and it had and it been a, used as an animal shelter or stable uh, behind some kind of inn or resting place. We don't know for certain these things. Um, what we do know is that God uh, overrules uh, the affairs of this world and right from the beginning of the story we discover that the Emperor Caesar Augustus orders that a census should take place. Um, and uh, the result is the young couple that were living in Nazareth are forced to go to Bethlehem, which is the prophesied place of the birth of Messiah. So we should never doubt the Father's power to move mountains to fulfil his purposes, whether back then at the birth of Christ or right now. The census, what was it? It was certainly to uh, find out everyone's details. I'm not sure if they ask the same kind of questions that we get asked these days. Uh, it would have probably been for the purpose of taxing the Jews. It would have been hated by Jewish zealots, Jewish revolutionaries who despised the uh, control of Rome over Israel. But to most Jews it would be just an inconvenient, uh, sudden interruption to normal life, particularly for those who had to travel to their town if they didn't live in the town they were presently in. If they didn't live in the town, forget it. <laughs> and it's just, an, just enough to think about. You're a couple nearing the uh, full term of the pregnancy and suddenly out of the blue there's this huge announcement that comes to your town that there's a Roman census and you have to travel to uh, have your uh, details recorded. Can you imagine the um, upheaval in your circumstances? Uh, but it's quite likely that Mary and Joseph, as faithful Jews, would have seen the providential hand of God in bringing them to Bethlehem, knowing that, that within Mary's womb uh, the Messiah was waiting to, uh, to be given to the world. And so that would have um, helped them in their journey. Uh, that journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem, uh, 90 miles, 144 kilometres, basically from Adelaide to Kadena, uh, in a car, a couple of hours, uh, on a donkey, if that's what 
Mary Road and we don't know for sure but it's quite possible. Uh, probably four days to seven days depending on whether they had uh, some breaks along the way and surely they would in, uh, with Mary in her state. Um, a long, demanding, exhausting journey for Mary and it would have been a bit of a worry for Joseph. And they come to the city of David. Bethlehem is the city where, or the town, we call it a city but it's the town, uh, where David, uh, 2,000 years before, um, was born and uh, who became the king. And uh, remember David was promised uh, a greater son, a descendant, who would be given an eternal kingdom, Messiah. And so it's to this town, the city of David, that Joseph and Mary come. Mary is said to be pledged uh, to be married to Joseph and, and she's expecting a child. Uh, in Matthew's Gospel we're told that when Mary came back from visiting that six months with Elizabeth, uh, Joseph, uh, because of the word of an angel, uh, took Mary to herself. He was going to uh, release her from the betrayal, uh, release her from the engagement, which in those days was pretty well the equivalent of marriage. The engagement, the betrayal, betrothal involved a public giving of vows uh, and then there was the period there would be nothing more to be done except for the man to take the woman to himself in his own home. And that could happen quite some time after that betrothal. Uh, but still, it was not full marriage until the final consummation. And, uh, and so when Mary returns to Nazareth, it appears that they were finally brought together as a couple, but still he would not have relations. Uh, he would not uh, join with her physically until after the birth. And so they travel uh, in Luke's terms as those who have been pledged to be married because in Jewish eyes the full marriage would be the consummation uh, sexually. Um, so in some ways to leave Nazareth where the judgments of that close-knit community would have been upon Mary and Joseph. Uh, that would have been a bit of a, a release and uh, to go on this journey together. Um, but there, there was no happy settling in period for the couple. Instead just this great upheaval of, of going to Bethlehem. And then when they arrive there's no uh, hospital that she's booked in for um, not even a cheap and cosy hotel. Uh, couldn't even find relatives to stop with. Maybe if there were relatives, distant relatives, they didn't want to know them. Who knows? All we know is that, uh, is that at the time of, a, of the baby's arrival, and we're not even sure whether that was the first night because the word is simply now it came to pass while they were there. Uh, the days were fulfilled for her to give birth. So they may have been there a few days. However, what we do know is that there'd been no place, no room in any of the accommodation and uh, they were certainly in a very humble circumstance, possibly a stable. Uh, and when uh, the baby was born, she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger literally a feeding trough for animals, hopefully with clean straw, uh, who knows, but uh, a very humble circumstance and Luke actually speaks of it three times in verse uh, 7 and then later on in verse 12 and then when the shepherds actually arrive uh, and see him lying in the manger Um, we could say Jesus came into the world just like any of us. He wasn't born in a palace. But actually, how many of us 
were placed as a baby in an animal feeding trough. <laughs> this, is the, this is the king of Israel. This is the saviour of the world. And God cannot organise a better place for the baby to be put. Or does he organise it just as he planned? That we might know that God does not have to do things the way this world seems fit. That God's love is such that he will let his son um, begin a life that will be um, always a place uh, where there's no place for him to his own people who won't receive him. Um, I don't think Luke wants us to have great pity that there was no room in the inn. I think Luke would have us just marvel and wonder at the miracle of God's love in placing his baby, his son, the son incarnate in such humble circumstances to begin uh, his journey to a cross and, uh, and to the place where he will be known as the great saving Lord of humanity. Well, you'd think that uh, at least God would have awakened Bethlehem, uh, organised a, a great celebration, a great party, um, invited the local dignitaries, both the political and religious leaders, involved the local media. I don't know whether there were, was anything like that, but uh, you know what I'm saying. A bit of publicity and uh, get the news out. Uh, publicise it. Uh, a few angels around the manger would be impressive and that would be conclusive evidence that Messiah has been born even if he's been placed in a manger. Now we might think there were angels there. Well there would have been but unseen. The only angels that were seen was out in a paddock outside Jerusalem in the dark by a group of shepherds. And shepherds were actually not high up in status in Jewish society. So what is God doing? God is not about trying to impress the world or prove anything to the world. He's come to redeem the world. And so he comes to shepherds. It's a wonderful uh, thing that... Um, well, David was a shepherd. He would have cared and protected his sheep around Bethlehem and uh, God is a shepherd. He comes to shepherd his people. This one born is to be the good shepherd. Interesting, a good shepherd because there were a lot of shepherds that weren't so good. Someone said that they didn't know how to tell the difference between mine and thine. They were not to be trusted. Uh, they took what wasn't theirs always. But these particular shepherds, we suspect, were looking forward. They were those who believed in the coming of Messiah and the angels came to them and uh, we're told that they were terrified. You know, when we see pictures of shepherds, you think, oh, they're beautiful, wonderful creatures, wow. Um, it appears that biblical angels, real angels, uh, their appearance, their brilliant glory, their size, we don't know what, how they come to people, terrify people. And that's what happened. The shepherds were terrified. Uh, firstly, one angel comes. The shepherds were looking after the sheep in the, during the night. That's what they did. Because at night time thieves and wild animals came. They'd make a, some kind of shelter with sticks and bushes, put the sheep in that area, it's called a sheepfold, and they'd camp right at the entrance to make sure there was nothing to attack and steal. And uh, they would take turns through the night. They were not expecting to be awakened to this angel of the Lord and, and suddenly this brilliant glory 
shining all around them. And uh, it took the angel to calm them down. Don't be afraid. Why? I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David a Saviour has been born to you. He is Christ. He is Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find fireworks and uh, wonderful... um, No, no, no. You'll just find him in a manger. That'll be the sign. Nothing that could prove to the world that this one is the Messiah, but it will confirm to you that what we are telling you is so. And suddenly a huge company of the heavenly host, a great army of angels, appear. And uh, you can imagine the shepherds just being overwhelmed. But by this stage, if they've received the truth of what the angel told them, overwhelmed with expectation and wonder. There is a God. Our God reigns and he's come now to visit Israel. He's come with Messiah as a baby. Our deliverer is born. And the great army of angels is declaring glory to God in the highest because of what God has done Glory to him and glory in heaven and peace on earth. The peace that the earth needs more than anything else. Peace with God. An end to God's judgment against our rebellion. Peace on earth on whom his favour rests. Now this verse has been taken in all sorts of ways um, and uh, even some of the translations do it slightly different. Um, In our carols it's put in a certain way and it can turn it totally in its wrong direction. I think it's simply this, glory to God in the highest. Uh, In other words, all heaven declares glory glory to God in the incarnation of his son and on earth peace. This is what God is doing. He's reconciling the world to himself and the birth of this Messiah is the only hope this world has of knowing true peace. And on men, good pleasure, not on men of good will, If people are of goodwill, they wouldn't need God's favour and grace. God's, this pleasure is always God's pleasure. It's never used to speak of a moral quality that is in us, being men of goodwill. It's always used in scripture to describe God's free pleasure in bringing salvation to the world. Uh, Remember in Ephesians 1, it's according to God's good pleasure that we've been chosen in Christ. Uh, Philippians talks about a God at work in us according to his will and pleasure. And in Matthew 26, Jesus declared it was the Father's good pleasure to hide the truth of the kingdom from the wise and the learned and to reveal them to children. It's God's pleasure to make his salvation known uh, to those who you would least expect. Another translation says, peace on those with whom God is well pleased. Well, if that's the only way we could have peace from God, would any of us know it of ourselves? Because if any of us pleased God, Are we well pleasing to God? There's one who was well pleasing to God, his son. No, the pleasure is God's pleasure in bringing this peace to the earth through the birth of his son and in thus 
glorifying his name forever. The angels are not glorying in man and his merits, but in God and his grace. He is the whole world's saviour, not just the good part of humanity. This is joy for all people. Initially that would have meant all Israel. If they could receive it, they could have this joy. But many didn't. But we can say it is joy for all humanity if they would receive it. Zephaniah 3.17 The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. You see, God has great joy, great pleasure in bringing his son to a humanity that has turned against him, that, is, that has rejected his word, that, is, that has uh, not believed his promises, that has sought up to set up its own merit before him which, which can never stand in his holy presence but in his great mercy and grace he has taken great pleasure to come and give us his son as our saviour, as our redeemer and as our king. Jeremiah 32.41 I will rejoice in doing them good and he says he will do this with all his heart and soul. God comes to bring salvation to the world. He is glad to bring salvation to the world in the birth of his Messiah. He has come to do us good with all his heart and soul. It is God's good pleasure to save us. That's a far cry from the thought that somehow Jesus Christ has uh, has uh, bent the Father's arm in order to, to convince him to forgive us. No, the Son is sent out of the fullness of the Father's grace that everyone who believes might know the Father's love. And it's an army of angels who announce such peace. Uh, one commentator said their exclamation, their announcement is not a wish but a triumphant affirmation of the existing blessed state of things. If only the world could know that. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself in his birth, in his life, death and resurrection. That reconciliation has been accomplished. There's nothing we can add to it. We can only believe it, receive it and begin to love as we've been loved. To love one another as we've been loved by him. To love the world as he loves the world. And to love God as he loves us. When the shepherds came, they said, let's go and see what we've been told. And they rushed and they finally found Mary and Joseph and they saw the baby in the manger and that convinced them, it's true what we've been told. And uh, now it's not just the angels that are praising God, it's the shepherds. We're told that they uh, went everywhere and they spread the word concerning what had been told. Well, that's as big, as big a fanfare as you got. And who would believe shepherds in the middle of the night who go back to their paddocks praising and glorifying God? They take something back into their, into their work that they didn't have before. Not, not in that, to that extent. Their hearts are full now. And if anything, the time of uh, this celebration of Christ's birth should just renew in us the joy that the glory, because we've believed what the word of God declares. And we're told Mary just treasured these things up and she pondered them in her heart 
she just kept on dwelling, thinking about what the shepherds had told them, which confirmed all that she already knew. And uh, the deep, just honour that she would feel and totally unworthy of such great grace to be the mother of our Lord. The world didn't have room for Joseph and Mary. It doesn't have room for Christ and we shouldn't expect it to. But what we should expect is that God will open up this heart and that heart and this nation and that nation by his mercy to receive the truth. Um, We actually need to be brought to the place where we glorify God for what he has done. If we're not there, then it may well be that we have not received Christ. How could you receive Christ and not share the wonder and the glory of knowing such a God? And the other thing I'd like to say, just as we close, is simply this. Christ did not abhor the virgin's womb. He was willing to come, the way we all come, born physically into this world. The son of Mary, who was not a saint, but a humble young woman of faith who needed a saviour just as we did. He did not see a manger as unworthy for his first bed. Not that he had much choice, but he saw it all coming as he chose to come into this world as God incarnate and he did not see that manger as unworthy. And he didn't see the cross as too shameful a death for one born to be king. And if we would believe it, he does not see our lives. The old clay pots of our lives as unworthy for his glory, for the treasure of his presence. For God who said let light shine out of darkness made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. If there ever was a jar of clay, it's the story of Luke chapter 2, isn't it? The circumstances... the hardships, the difficulties. Yes, God bearing testimony through the angels, through the shepherds, but nothing that would impress the world. But this is the way of God, this is the way of Christ and this is the way of glory. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And if we think And if we feel weak and tired and struggling, then take heart. This same Christ does not see our circumstances as unworthy of his presence and of his glory. Our gracious Father, glorious God, Thank you, dear Father, that by your Spirit we have received the witness of your word that's come to us down through the apostles and through the ages and through the faithful testimony of those who have loved Christ and you've opened our heart to believe your word concerning your Son, concerning this birth, this life, his death and his resurrection and his present reigning lordship. And though the world can't see it, 
or hear the angels sing, Father, thank you that we can. And you've borne witness to your great glory in our hearts and it's changed our lives and it's given us a hope and a destiny and a purpose. And Father, may we with all that in our hearts, like Mary, treasure and ponder these things and cause us, dear Father, to invest all that we are in that which is eternal and in that which is of your true love and mercy and grace that the world might believe. For we ask it in his name. Amen.